Testing one, two, three, four. I think I'm good to go here. For our third and final presentation, it's great to see many of you back. Uh, you're in for a treat yet again. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Bev Buller, uh, author and librarian. She's a retired educator, taught the middle school, high school, and the collegiate level. A degree from K-State, from uh, Wichita State University, from Emporia State. A uh, master's in library science as well as a master's in education. Um, and she's written four books or pub has published four books. Historical books, uh, books that talk about the history of Kansas in various locations. She's now a member of the Speakers Bureau um, of the uh, uh, Humanities uh, Kansas Council and is doing tours throughout the state uh, presenting on William Allen White. Is that correct? Excellent. So please give her a warm welcome on William Allen White. This is not the first time I've talked about William Allen White and Newton, and I'm glad that people still want to hear about them. Um, for Humanities Kansas, I feel like I'm loud. Am I loud for you guys? Okay, okay. Um, I'm used to having to get close. For, for the Humanities Kansas group, I don't want to just talk about William Allen White. There's way too much, so I narrowed it down. And I did this for three years, and then they've invited me back, so I get to keep doing it, which is good, because I already had like five or six booked for 2022. But I had to narrow it down. I thought, well, what's something about him that people don't know much about? And I'll mention it today in my talk. But the poor man who swore he would never seek political office ran for governor of Kansas in 1924. Now, if he had won... <laughs> Uh, he would have had to be kind of an absentee governor because he was a very busy man already, but it's a terrific story. So when I talk about, when I do my talks for Humanities Kansas, I call it A Real American Goes Hunting because there was a cartoon in the New York world in 1924 when he was running for governor that showed this little chubby man, I think W.A.W. is written on the back of his suit, and he's chasing after the Klan. And it says, a real American goes hunting. And he hunted using his pen and donating his time to run the Klan out of Kansas. So that's my, I do, I do all kinds of talks about actually all kinds of things since I've written four books. But today we're talking about William Allen White as a famous Kansan. In 2010, the Kansas Sampler Foundation, Marcy Penner and that group, uh, named William Allen White one of the eight wonders of Kansas. And I started doing this talk around that time, and when I was invited today, I thought, well, this is the perfect one, because it just kind of summarizes uh, William Allen White without going into too much detail. So if you want detail, you can read my book about him, you can read his autobiography, there's his collected letters, you could go on and on. Anyway, let's talk more about Mr. White. Um, he was a lifelong Kansan. He was born and raised in Kansas, he died in Kansas on Kansas Day, 1944, and I feel that he still brings positive attention to our state. And children still learn about him in school. Adults are still discovering things about him. Every now and then, his name's mentioned on national TV, and I get all excited. They quoted William Allen White. He still is an important person, even though he's been gone since a lot of us before we were born. He's been gone since 1944. But uh, he is a Kansas wonder, and I'll show you why. He was born in Emporia uh, in 1868. His father was a Civil War veteran who did have a medical degree from Case, Case Western, and but had he practiced medicine, but in the 1860s, he did whatever else needed to be done. So he set up a drugstore in different places or a general store, and then he could doctor on the side. Um, his mother had been a teacher, so that combination created a very interesting and really learned, for his time period, young man. Now, William Allen White was born in Emporia, and he died in Emporia, but he also grew up in El Dorado. 
When White was barely a year old, his family went by horse and wagon to Emporia. I imagine they don't have, didn't have a whole lot of belongings because his father said Emporia was too crowded. You could imagine in 1869 how crowded Emporia was. And this is truly where he grew up. But his mother wrote a letter home that I found a copy of. She was from uh, Minnesota, if I remember right. Her, her sister lived in Minnesota. And she said, we are on the edge of the prairie. And so William Allen White had a truly rural childhood. He saw Indians. He had a pet raccoon. There was a barn where he could play. Uh, and so, but his father was became mayor of El Dorado. So he also had that aspect that his father was a learned man, um, and he he uh, benefited from that. Now, if you look at his grade card, I, his grades probably don't show up real well. He's got some 80s, 90s. He's got a hundred in grammar. He's got a hundred in geography. But in this audience, I can say deportment. And you'll know what I'm talking about. I have to explain that when I talk to kids. He got, what, a 70. And to me, that summarizes William Allen White. He loved people. And I think he would be that child that you would have to constantly be moving. He could not sit by his friends because he would be trying to make them laugh or entertain them. So he got a 70 in deportment. Um, in times tardy, only one. No, that's absence. Anyway, he, he, I think he was kind of a character, um, and I think his personality developed very early. He did have a brother, but the brother died in infancy, which was not uncommon. So according to his autobiography, which was written kind of tongue-in-cheek, he said, I was happy to be an only child. <laughs> he was happy when his, his brother died. Of course, he would have been too little to even know, really. So he was raised an only child in El Dorado. Um, and I mentioned his father was mayor. His father was really active. He was a Democrat. And he was really active in politics. And so little Willie, as they call him, I think it even says, yeah, it says Willie White on his report card. Uh, Willie would go with him. And so he remembered the state capitol being built. And he, you know, would go to all these different uh, political, but they were all Democrat things, uh, with his father. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others came and stayed at their home. The father built a beautiful home for the time, well, even any time, uh, in El Dorado. It's been torn down now. It's where the post office is in El Dorado. I'm going to be speaking there again in a couple weeks, but they've got a little monument for Mr. White that was put up on his 100th birthday. But it was a big two-story white house. And for a while, they ran it as a hotel. But then it became just the family home, even though it was only the three of them. But then it became the two of them. When Will was about 14, his father died. And as he says in his autobiography, he became the man of the house. And he really did. He had his mother with him the rest of his life. He took care of her. Uh, he they he would live with her from time to time. Like when he went to KU, she bought a house in Lawrence so that he could live with her. So she was always with him up until her death in 1929, I believe it was. Um, while in El Dorado, he got his first job. And guess what? It was for a newspaper. He didn't last long at that job because he found out his father was writing his paychecks. <laughs> His dad wanted him, he was young, obviously, he was only 14 when his dad died, but his dad wanted him to work. And so he told the newspaper office, let him be a printer's devil, let him run errands, sweep the floor, and then I'll write his pay, I'll pay for it. And so he got upset, but then that, that's where he discovered that he liked newspapers and he wanted to work for one. So as he got older, he moved to Kansas City. I mentioned he went to KU, he never graduated. He could never pass the mathematics class that was required. I can relate. Uh, we're both word people. And uh, he worked for the Kansas City Journal, the Kansas City Star, and he met this lovely woman, Sally Lindsay. And Sally was from the South originally. Um, she had been a school teacher, perfect, because his mom had been a school teacher. They got along wonderfully. 
They married in 1893, and within two years, they had fulfilled their dream of owning a newspaper. And what they were looking for was a newspaper in a college town. They wanted to be somewhere where things were happening, and there would be entertainment, and there would be lectures they could go to, because they were just such interesting people. And uh, they looked in Manhattan, they looked in Lawrence, those papers were not for sale, but they found the Emporia Gazette and bought it in 1895. Sally was always his first reader, and he would run things past her. They were a real wonderful combo together. And it's good because they bought the paper in 1895, and in 1896, he wrote an editorial called What's the Matter with Kansas? And that propelled him to national fame because Mark Hanna, who was managing uh, the re-election of um, McKinley, read it, contacted this white who he'd never heard of, and said, hey, McKinley wants to use what's the matter with Kansas in his re-election campaign, can we? He said yes, and that was the first president he met because McKinley came through Kansas, uh, white got on board the train. I think he rode, they used to do that, he rode to the next stop with him or something. So McKinley became his first president. So he went from being... This, as he, he described himself, pudgy little man, uh, to being someone that everybody wanted to know about. And about 1897, I think, he had his first book published, and all it was was a collection of editorials he had already written. Because everybody was like, who is this man? Nowadays, you Google him. But back then, you know, we want to read more, so a book was published, and that was the first of about 20 books that he wrote. So he and Sally married in 93, and they bought the paper in 1895. They bought the home that they lived in the rest of their life in 1890, well, really in 1900. They started renting it in 1899, and then were able to buy it. It was made of red sandstone from the front range of the Rockies. Every now and then, someone I'll hear someone doing a talk on white, and they'll say it's from the Garden of the Gods. Now, how likely is that they're going to let you go and quarry stone from the Garden of the Gods? No, but it, it is red sandstone, so it, it's very much like it. This picture would be one that was taken before it was remodeled. So if you visit it now or drive by it now, it's been remodeled. That corsair on the front side there is gone. The porch is much broader you know, it's still the same house, but I mean, and they've added dormer windows and that sort of thing. This is White and his little daughter Mary, if you look close, on the front porch, uh, along with their, their horse, Old Tom, and their buggy. He wrote an editorial about that. Uh, they remodeled the house. That was in the planning for quite a while. He had been uh, to Chicago and seen his publisher's house, which was brand new. And it was, it was uh, designed by this guy named... Frank Lloyd Wright. And White said, I gotta get him. I want him to remodel my house. Well, if you know anything about Frank Lloyd Wright, he was not very excited about remodeling an old Victorian. He said it had warts and tumors all over it, was how he described it. There's wonderful letters between the two men. But he did get, because this was early in Wright's career, so he did get him to start planning the way the house would look. But by the time it came right down to it, and, and by that time, Wright was saying, oh, well, you can't have all that ugly old furniture. Well, it was my parents. You've got to get rid of it. I'm going to give you beautiful new things. Because, you know, Wright even would plan what your, your dishes were and everything. So they parted ways. We're still friends. And uh, they rec a White Wright recommended, this gets confusing, Wright recommended to White that he use a company called White and White <laughs> in Kansas City. So... Wright started remodeling, but White, W-I-G-H-T, finished it. And that would have been, uh, really, I think it was the fall of 21 that they moved into the remodeled house. They needed their house to be remodeled because Teddy Roosevelt came in this house, and I don't know where the poor man slept or anything. It was a smaller Victorian home, really. You evidently went in that door right behind where he's standing, which still is, if you take a tour, you go in that door. But... You would go upstairs immediately. Well, now they moved everything around. And the front door is now over on this other side with a nice porch. And, the, and then where he's standing is a big, beautiful porch. We even hold programs there. Um, 
So they needed a house that had ensuite bathrooms. Some of the bedrooms upstairs have bathrooms either connected or real close. Because after all, if, if uh, President Hoover is coming to stay with you, are you really going to make him share a bathroom with somebody? You know. So it was a lovely home. It was a guest. It turned into a guest house after it was remodeled. Now we don't give tours of the third floor, but we do tell people that there there are there's like two or three bathrooms up there. And as you know, most homes this had no bathrooms when it was first built. So they moved in that house about 1900, and that same year, their first child was born. They had a boy named William Lindsay White. He was named after his father, and Lindsay was his mother's maiden name. Uh, Will insisted he be called Bill, so it didn't get too confusing. William Allen White really did not, he never, I never saw that he argued with people, but he did not like to be called Bill. And his wife just said, his name is William. You can call him Will. And when I wrote a book about him, I had to, I used the word Willie. to describe, That was his name when he was little. But boy, once his dad died, he became Will. So we have Will and then we have Bill. So that was in 1900. And in 1904, his, their daughter, Mary Catherine, was born. She was named after Will's mother, Mary Ann. Her maiden name was Hatton, Mary Ann Hatton White. Um, Mary was a very sickly baby. It's really kind of amazing she lived. The photos of her, she's a scrawny little infant, uh, but she grew to be very strong and active. And I have to wonder if, if she wasn't encouraged to you know, be physical. Bill was the one you would find in the parlor reading or collecting insects. Mary would be the one out chasing every kid in the neighborhood, fighting with boys, you know, just you know, they're dressed up for this picture, but their parents didn't make them dress this way all the time. The grandmother, I told you, White's mother was always with him. The year Mary was born, she built her own home that still stands to the south of Red Rocks. There's a big old red brick house. It belongs to the State Historical Society also now. We haven't done anything with it, but we're hoping eventually we'll get funding and we can make it into a, like a, an author center or something. It needs a lot of interior remodeling. So they had their parents and they had their grandma just you know right across the garden. Wonderful childhood. Um, also in 1904, Mr. White made one of his many visits to Newton. He was very political. I should mention, I, I mentioned that the dad was a Democrat. After the dad died, he was left with his mom. And his mom was a Republican. And I think to make peace, he thought, I'm going to fight with her the rest of my life if I become a Democrat like my dad. So I'm just going to be a Republican. Now, Mary Ann Catton was a Republican for good reason. She got to hear Lincoln in one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates at Knox College. And so she loved Lincoln to her dying day. And anyway, he, so he was Republican, but he would go all over the state and he would usually be, he would usually hook up with someone in the town and they were, you know, promoting a campaign or something. Um, I, you probably can't read it. The last line here is, uh, that will draw, a, that it will draw a crowd is just as good as settled. You know, they, he was popular uh, even then and, and came to Newton. Uh, 1904 is when Teddy Roosevelt was running for president, uh, and uh, Hope was running for governor, so I'm sure this was something to do with that. And this was one of many times he went all over the state. Now, in about 1912, the White family bought a getaway. Back then, it was called Moraine Park. Now it's Estes. It's Rocky Mountain National Park now. So this is their cabin that they bought and remodeled. Over the years, they added a riding cabin back behind for Will. They added a bunk house for Mary, and they would always have family and friends and famous people. Jane Addams would go out there a lot and visit them. They only went in the summer, because that's what you did back then. It would be very hot in Kansas, and you could you could head over to, uh, to Colorado. Um, and Will and Sally had honeymooned in Colorado, and so they, they would go, they would rent cabins. And in 1912, one came up for sale and they were able to buy it. And then over the years added to it. Will said in his autobiography that this cabin was to be for all our lives a haven and a refuge. 
and it was. He would, he would get writing done. He would get work done there. Uh, the National Park Service owns it now, and they let me look in their storage facility when I was writing my first book. And they had looked under the porch and pulled out, you know, broken china and ver or pottery and various things. But they also found a bunch of old postcards on which Mr. White had written encouraging, you know, back to Kansas, like, be sure you vote and be sure you vote for so-and-so. So even when he was out there, he was working on books and he was working on his paper, of course, and, and also on Republican politics. Um, Mr. White is a Kansas wonder because he had a rewarding career. This check was one of several. This is in the archives at Emporia State now. One of several that was found in a book. It was never cashed. You couldn't cash it now. When I show this to kids, they're like, wow, why didn't you cash? Well, no, I'm sure that bank isn't even around anymore. Macmillan still is, that was his publisher. But that's a $6,000, almost $7,000 check. And this tells me that Mr. White, number one, had plenty of money. But also, number two, I like to think he, he wasn't writing and he wasn't doing everything he did just for the money. He did it for the love of Kansas and the love of, of writing and, and communicating. So his career, I mentioned he worked for El Dorado Papers, for Kansas City Papers, he owned his own paper, and he wrote over 20 books. So he had a very, well, and then in his older years, which I'll get to in a minute, he became internationally known, and, and he gave of his time. He was on numerous committees, a lot of them were with the Republican Party, but also with with the country and as he got older, which I'll get to in a minute. I mentioned that his home needed to be remodeled because they even had presidents visit. Teddy Roosevelt was someone that he considered one of his best friends. Uh, he met Teddy when he was head of the Navy and uh, he was with him like a day after McKinley died. And he writes about it in the, uh, in the autobiography that you know now my friend is going to be president. And here he is visiting the family. You can, this is, my editor did research. The young man sitting on the step opposite Sally holding Bill and his dog is Emmelyn Roosevelt, who was a cousin and was traveling with Teddy. So that was some kind of fun that came out of the publication of this book. Um, but Teddy came, uh, Hoover became a special favorite. And Hoover even came after Mr. White died. Uh, they did a Peter Pan Park in Emporia, was donated to the city by the Whites. They had been quietly buying land for years and said, we don't want it named White. We want it named Peter Pan after our daughter. And uh, they did a dedication. There's a, a bust of Mr. White and then the Mary White editorial by the Reflecting Pool. And Hoover came back for that uh, in the 50s. There's a good picture. It might be in my book. I can't remember. So Hoover was a special friend. And uh, Mr. White was at the heart of a new progressive party in 1912. It was called the Bull Moose Party because Teddy once said, I'm as fit as a bull moose. As most of you should know, that party did suffer the defeat. The Republican Taft got elected. And uh, Mr. White... He had to go to La Jolla, California to recover. He had kind of a nervous breakdown. He would work himself into a, a tizzy. And, and just, they called it nervous exhaustion back then. And so the family just picked up uh, probably in December of that year and just went out to La Jolla and sat on the beach. And from what it said in his autobiography, he said, I couldn't even work. I was just sick that, that Teddy didn't get to be president again. But he got over it, and he did his best to support Taft. He always supported the Republican candidate until the few times he didn't. Um, he did serve his country in World War I by going over there uh, to France and kind of inspecting the troops, the conditions, and reporting back for the Red Cross. He went with his friend uh, Henry Allen, who was a newspaper owner in Wichita, and he actually did have a home built by Frank Lloyd Wright. It's a wonderful museum to go visit. Um, but he got a book out of this. He had written letters to his wife home 
and she kept them, and then after they got back, they put the letters, or he used the letters to, t to write a funny story called The Adventures of Henry and Me. No, The Marshall Adventures of Henry and Me. And the two men even got, uniform, got uniforms to wear while they were over there, and they bought, bought them out of their own pocket. Um, and he said, he said this, was a story, this is the story of two overweight, middle-aged men leaving their wives to serve their country. <laughs> That's how he saw it. And he did. He did serve his country. So that would have been um, 1918, probably into 1919. Then, in 1921, White suddenly had a daughter to memorialize. Uh, his daughter Mary, I already said, was extremely energetic, outspoken, ornery, fun-loving, very smart, there's no doubt, and could be a very giving person. Other accounts you read, she would tease and be mean. <laughs> but I think, depending on who you talk to, um, Mary loved horses. And even though the family did have a car that they let Mary drive until someone told them, and I, I have this in an oral history, someone told them that Mary was seen on Commercial Street, which is Main Street in Emporia, she was seeing the family car with some friends going Wee! with her hands off the wheel. And so the person that was doing the oral history said, after that, the whites let her take the car, but I had to drive because I kept both hands on the wheel. Well, she rode horses that way too. And she was always having accidents. There are number, there are a number of telegrams that mention Mary's had another accident. Well, on May 10, 1921, she went on her usual horseback ride after school. She would go home and change her clothes and put on her riding outfit, her job furs and such, and go her cowboy hat and go for a ride. And on that particular afternoon, there was a freak accident. And it really is a freak, and it's ironic. She was riding uh, really kind of west of the library at Emporia State on Merchant. She was heading north, probably going to... I don't know where, out, well, definitely out to the Flint Hills. And she turned to wave at a boy throwing the Gazette. That, to me, is so ironic. And in doing so, she did not notice that up ahead was a big, low-hanging branch. While she was still turned around, her head hit. And back then, they didn't do an x-ray until a couple of days later, and so she died uh, on Friday the 13th, 1921. Mr. White felt like, what well, he said in his autobiography, Sally and I agreed we had to put Mary to bed, meaning, you know, we needed to share her with Euphoria. So he wrote this fabulous editorial, and it went viral, as much as anything can go viral in 1921. I have tracked it through the papers. It was at Las Vegas the very next day in the papers. I mean, it went all over. Because back then, well, and actually still, people lose 16-year-olds and younger in accidents like that. And Mr. what Mr. White said back then from his own heart still holds true. So it's a, it's a very important editorial. Um, the other thing that is so interesting to me about Mary, I think her, her energy and her honoriness and certainly her knowledge, her understanding of everything would have really been, would have blossomed as she became a young woman. She had, her brother was at Harvard when she had her accident. Of course, he came home. But Mary was a junior at uh, Emporia State. It was in May, so she was almost to be a senior. And she had already been accepted at Wellesley. And I know, what could she, what would have happened to her? Edna Ferber, the writer, was a good friend, spent much time at the White's home. And she wrote an editorial in the New York World uh, while Mary was still alive, it was in 1914, and she said um, something like, I predict Mary White is presidential timber, and by 1941, she'll be our president. <laughs> Who knows? But when people talk about William Allen White, it seems they always mention Mary, because that editorial he wrote, he never won any awards for it. I listen to people talk about White, and I'll say, oh, and he won a Pulitzer Prize for that wonder. No, he won no prize other than the love of the whole world, and people still love the editorial, and they love Mary. Uh, he did win a Pulitzer Prize. 
but not till two years after Mary died. He, Mr. White, I was talking to some folks in the audience about this, Mr. White loved to recycle what he had written. We're all guilty of that. I remember doing it in college. You know, you take a paper you've already written and you pull a few things and you add new stuff, you make it new. But he had written a letter to his friend here on the right. And by, by that time, he was Governor Allen, Henry Allen of Wichita. And, and in the letter, he, he was talking about free speech and saying, you know, don't worry about it. It's going to all be okay. And, and people need to say what they need to say. And so he thought, hey, I can recycle that. So he made it into an editorial called To an Anxious Friend. And that won the Pulitzer Prize for uh, editorial writing in 1923 which was one of the many wonderful things that happened to him, uh, that ed the letter and the editorial were written during the railroad strike that was happening, and Governor Allen had forbid the posting of signs in windows supporting the strikers. Mr. White put a sign in his window uh, and was technically arrested. We never have figured out if he really served time in jail. He supposedly did, according to the papers. He was arrested. But he was arrested in time that it made the papers. <laughs> and uh, so, and the, the two men remained lifelong friends. This picture was taken when Mr. White spoke at Emporia State uh, back then. It wasn't called Emporia State, but this would have been 1922, probably. And the whole town turned out because they were afraid the two men were going to like get in a physical fight. And no, they were very good friends. And I'm sure that's why this picture was taken. Um, shortly after this, Mr. White's mother died, the lady that lived next door, uh, in, uh, in 1924. And I think she suffered from dementia because there was an article in the paper at the time of Mary's death that said her grandmother has not been told. Well, that tells me that there was no reason to tell her grandmother. So she died in 1924, and then that house became a rental. And this is something that Mr. White learned from his father. Uh, his father really set the family up quite well in El Dorado by having rentals. And they continued to do this. And when they were remodeling their house, he bought the house two doors south of Red Rocks. And I've talked to people that live there. And, and if he had actually the house two doors south, if he had someone at the Gazette, of whom he was quite fond, he would let them live in one of his rentals. And that's what he did with the house. And Mary White died in that house. It's two doors south of Red Books. But the mother died in 1924. So now he had some time on his hands. <laughs> and the 1924 gubernatorial election was an interesting one. We had two candidates, uh, the incumbent Davis, and then the Republican candidate Pollan. Mr. White and a lot of other, especially newspaper editors around Kansas, discussed the fact that do we really want someone that has ties to the Klan? Now, Mr. Davis would always say, I am, he worded it real carefully, I currently have no time, currently, meaning in the past he had, and what about the future? And Pollen wouldn't even address it. But Mr. White noticed that pollen signs were showing up in windows of businesses that he knew were, were run by Klan members. So he, had, he, was, he was tapping everyone he knew and saying, would you run for governor, please? Would you run for governor? No. So finally, in September of 1924, White announced he would be running. And he didn't do this. I'm sorry. I did not mean to do that. Um, he didn't do this on a whim. He, well, in order to be on the ballot, you had to uh, have a petition that had to be signed by, I'm sorry, I'm not good with numbers. I should have it written down. Anyway, he got like five times the number of signatures, and all of them were from outside of Lyon County. So, you know, he proved that people do want me to run. So he ran as an independent, not a write-in. He was really on the ballot. And this, he took this picture to show in this 1919 Dodge car, which was driven mostly by his son, Bill. Uh, he traveled 2,783 miles across the state because, of course, he did not start campaigning until September. So he had six weeks, and he paid for everything from his own bank account. And I have the amount, but I don't remember it because I didn't write it down. It, 
it's not much at all. Because as he would go around the state, he would stay with other newspaper editors, and they would feed him, and it caught, he had to pay for gas, and that was about it. He did come in third, which he didn't want to be governor. I mean, he wanted to make, he said, toward the end, he would say, I'm not, I'm only running for a principal, PLE. And he came in third. But what happened was, and the world was watching when this happened, he, as he traveled around the state, he would mention uh, other candidates, particularly the um, attorney general who was running for re-election, who were anti-Klan. And so he would say, please give them your vote. Well, those anti-Klan folks got re-elected or got elected. And in that respect, the Klan was run out of Kansas. They were dangerously close to taking over every office they could have had. But with the attorney general who had already started the process, the Klan was not allowed a charter to do business. They never had bothered to get a charter. Well, that's illegal to have a business, and it certainly was a business. They were selling their uniforms and everything. So the Klan was effectively run out of Kansas because William Allen White brought the attention of the world. And of course, Kansas was not the only state that was seeing a rise of the Klan in, 19, in the 1920s. About the time after Mary died, Mary was not really around for that. She would have gotten such a kick out of her dad doing this. But he, he sacrificed three months or really more out of his own life to bring attention. And he had a wonderful letter, which I share when I talk about this thing, uh, this time in his life. Wonderful letter from the president that, uh, that New Year's. I, it might be late December. But he says, thank you for your service to the country. Well, what does that mean? Mr. White knew what it meant. And he wrote in his own handwriting, this was when I was driving the Klan out of Kansas. So he felt like the president, well, I know the president was, was thanking him for what he did. Something interesting about Mr. White, he traveled a lot. They went all over the place. But in the middle of, well, 1923, uh, when I don't know if he really knew he was going to run for governor yet, but they took a trip to the Mediterranean. Uh, with some other friends from Wichita, and here they are. Uh, they went to Hawaii, Haiti, the Philippines. They went back to Europe in 1933, and his home, which is a state historic site, is full of the mementos that he, he has a, a German helmet, and just all kind. They went to Pompeii. He has all kinds of stuff in his house on display that he got through his travels. But I thought only Mr. White would just take a vacation in the middle of because when he came home in 1923. Uh, the sheriff, all the elected offices were filled by Klan members. <laughs> well, he was gone because he wasn't there to call attention to it. He took care of them. Um, I've mentioned that Mr. White got quite a bit of recognition as he got older. He began to be called the Sage of Emporia in midlife. That was about age 65. Uh, when he turned 70, a brass band greeted him at work, and all the major magazines were there, life and look and time, to take pictures of him. Um, and he, he was ready, I noticed he was ready when he turned 70, with a pithy quote that he knew would be reprinted in all the papers. And it was. He said at age 70, I am not afraid of tomorrow because I have seen yesterday and I love today. That's sure how I feel. And so that was, that, that was, it made it sound like he was saying that just off the cuff, but it showed up in all the papers. So I know he planned it out. Also in midlife, he started getting honorary degrees. This one uh, was him at uh, Harvard with his honorary degree. He got, this is one of 10 that he got. A lot of people say, oh, he was such good friends with Einstein. There's not one letter between the two men. There is no evidence that Einstein ever came to Emporia. And I find it interesting that they never even wrote letters back and forth, but there aren't any, and they kept all his letters. They were all on carbon paper. There were copies of all his letters. So they met, you can tell they're very genial, but they were not friends. You know, the background of this is Harvard, but it looks like the backyard of Red Rocks. And I think that's why people think that, oh, Einstein came to Emporia. But he got uh, the 10 honorary degrees. He also made a lasting contribution to journalism. 
I'll just say a few of the things. He was elected president of the American Society of Newspaper Editors in 1935. Uh, he also, in 1944, shortly after he died, although he was told about it before he died, uh, he got the first gold medal for distinguished service from that same organization. They had never done it for anybody. They now, I think they still do it, but he got the first one for distinguished service. Um, he had, was working on his autobiography at the time that he was diagnosed with, he called it intestinal cancer. I don't know if it was colon cancer, stomach cancer, whatever, but he knew he was going to die. And so he asked his wife and son if they would finish the autobiography. And that autobiography was published in 1946. It's really not done, except it's an autobiography. So how do you really finish that? And, and the time it would take if you hadn't lived all that. So the son and the wife kind of wrote a postscript summing up the rest of it. The last chapter, if I remember right, is on Mary's death. And then he never went back to, to it after that. But that book won a second Pulitzer Prize for him in 1946. Um, he had a never-ending love for his home state. He loved to celebrate Kansas Day. They would always have a Kansas Day dinner. Uh, he would go in Topeka because he was, among other things, president of the Kansas State Historical Society. So he was very involved in that. Uh, they installed a statue of Mr. White in 1981 in the Capitol, along with Amelia Earhart and many others. They're in little alcoves in one of the rotundas. He had many quotes uh, about Kansas, one of my favorites. Well, on my scarf today, I have Kansas is a state of mind. Mm -hmm. He also said, I think very accurately, when anything is going to happen in this country, it happens first in Kansas. And you think about it, it there's a lot of them. Uh, I mentioned already that he did indeed die on Kansas Day. 1944, which of course the papers loved that. It was so appropriate for him. Uh, and he was buried, he is buried, in Emporia next to Mary and his mother. And his, they moved his father. Um, he left behind a son, Bill. Uh, Bill went his own way. Uh, it would be very hard to live in the shadow of a father like William Allen White. Not that Mr. White was mean or anything, but he his shadow was so so huge and so spreading. And so Bill went back east and began to work for newspapers starting in Washington, D.C. Then he, and his, he got married in 1931. He moved back, they, they moved back east in 32, and they were both in uh, journalism. His wife uh, helped start Life Magazine and worked for Time Magazine. He had eventually a lifetime assignment for Reader's Digest. He was like a roving reporter. And during the Second World War, he went over to uh, Britain on a destroyer that we were loaning them, or really giving them, and he wrote a story about it for Life magazine. Uh, so he kind of made a name for himself. He also wrote books. When his father knew that he was dying, he said, I hope you'll come and run the paper. Well, he, he did want to do that, but he realized he and his wife, even back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and he died in 73, you know, you could have a bi-coastal life. They had a good staff at the Gazette. There was a telegram. There was a telephone. So he and his wife had kept their apartment in New York, came and lived in Red Rocks, but they were only there part of the year, uh, although he, he really did run the paper. He just wasn't always physically there. Now, I mentioned that Bill uh, spent time in, uh, in Europe, or well, in England specifically. He went over there to cover the Blitz for the North American Newspaper Alliance. He would file stories. Uh, his wife, back in New York City, would help with that. And she had told him before they left, she knew she could not have children. And she said, you know, I'm reading about war orphans. Maybe while you're over there, in your spare time, you can look up some kids for us. And he literally wrote it in his reporter's notebook. Look up kids. He found two children through the National Adoption Society in London. One of them was Barbara, 
And she was about two, although she turned three before she came over here, shortly before she came over here. And then there was a little boy. Well, there was a war on. So in, in January 19, we're going to get this right, January 1941, it was before Pearl Harbor, by almost a year, he got the word, you can fly home. But, this will sound familiar, you can only have, I think it was 45 pounds on the plane, because it, it was not a passenger plane. And Barbara was the lighter of the two. So Barbara was the little person that he adopted. And she became a white in every sense of the word. Uh, Barbara, and I know her, she's still living, and her husband uh, were living in Connecticut when the father wrote that letter. I've got, guess what? I've got intestinal, intestinal cancer, just like my dad. I know you kids probably don't want the paper. Well, they did. And so Mr. White, Mr. White was, well, Mr. William Lindsay White, Bill, was thrilled. So Barbara and her husband ran the paper. Um, in 1995, they celebrated 100 years of ownership by the family of William Allen White. Now, her mother, Catherine, died in 1988, but that one, there's pictures of her working at that paper. I don't know how she did it, but she was totally dedicated and, and had a really strong work ethic and standard. She wanted that paper to never have a misspelled word or have any kind of factual inaccuracy. I've talked to people that worked under her. I would have liked her, I think, but they didn't because, I don't know. She might not have been very kind in how she said it. So Barbara had, and Barbara had a fascinating childhood. She told me about going to uh, Thanksgiving in the White House with the Rose, with, with the FDR. And she said, yes, mother made me go to school that morning. And then I, uh, I had to change clothes to go to the White House. And I said, do you have any proof of that? And she said, well, I do have a letter that I thank you know. And I said, oh, if you could find it, she never found it. I've written a book about Barbara, but it's never found a publisher. And now, and I wrote it kind of more for kids. I wanted it to be a little history of the Blitz and that kind of thing. Uh, so it's, there's go I think there's going to be a book about her for adults coming out. I've talked to the authors. Uh, and finally, there is a great grandson to carry on. Barbara and her husband adopted four children they felt the same way as her father, she told me. That, you know, we know we're going to have to sell a paper because none of the kids want it. Well, their youngest son, Christopher, here on the right, had gone to the University of Kansas and was a William Allen White School of Journalism grad. He and his wife, Ashley, have taken over the paper. So they're the ones that run it now. And as many of you know, it's a difficult time to run the paper, a paper. But they are still running the Emporia Gazette. And Chris tells me, that these great great grandkids of William Allen White, the girl, the oldest girl, Grace, has expressed a desire to take over the paper someday. So time will tell. This picture was taken probably eight years ago. The little boy, by the way, is Will. And one of the girls is Hatton, which that was William Allen White's mother's maiden name. So they're carrying on. And speaking of names carrying on, there are three elementary schools that bear the name of William Allen White around our state. One is directly across the street from Red Rocks and Emporia, one in Wichita. They call it White Elementary, but it's William Allen White. William Allen White Library uh, at Emporia State University was dedicated in 1952. And down below, the journalism school I mentioned at KU was founded in 1945 and moved into Flint Hall later. And of course, Flint Hall was just remodeled uh, within the past couple of years. I got to do a talk there, that was so much fun. Since 1980, the William Allen White Foundation at KU has given a William Allen White Award every year. You might find it interesting if you've been here most of the afternoon to know that Gordon Parks received the award in 2006 and he was still living and was able to go receive it. This year's uh, recipient is Sanjay Gupta of CNN, who is a practicing neurologist and has been a voice of reason, I think, with COVID. And one more thing about his legacy, uh, the William Allen White Children's Book Award has held a place of, in the lives of Kansas kids since 19. 
52, which means it turns 70 this year. And there was a documentary created by Academy Award winning uh, screenplay writer Kevin Wilmot of Kansas University. This was created to celebrate William Allen White's 150th birthday. It's called What's the Matter with Kansas? You can watch it on pbs.org. And as I mentioned, you can see for yourself Mr. White's home. Here it is remodeled. Uh, it is it was the state's newest historic site. They have added one more since this became an historic site. Uh, it, right now it's closed in the winter, but you can call or email using the uh, Kansas State Historical Society website, and you can, you can tour it any time of year by appointment, but it is open 11 to 5, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from uh, April until the end of October. So pretty soon it's gonna be open daily again. And finally, you can read all about it in the two books that I wrote about Mr. White. These were both named Kansas Notable Books, which means that pretty much every library in Kansas at one point would have had them so they can be checked out from the library. I have been selling copies out there, so if anybody wants a copy, I'm happy to sell them. They were carrying uh, my Mary White book in the gift shop. I don't know if they still are, but I've got them, so if anyone's interested. I'm sure I've gone over my time. Um, are there any questions? And if you don't want to ask publicly, feel free to come up. I'll put my mask back on, and we can, I can answer questions. Yes? Can you in your biography uh, of uh, William Allen White, uh, did you follow another biography, or did you have did you have a recommendation for books that would be excellent questions? Good models, for right? Mine is an original. Thank you. That's a very good question. Mine is an original biography because I was writing for my own students. I was writing for. Well, it's written at an eighth grade reading level, which is kind of what newspapers and popular fiction is written at. But it's full of photos, and I read everything I could get my hands on. And I have a bibliography. So the collected letters, there's a couple of really good biographies, but nothing real recent. So mine's the most recent. Uh, so yes, it was a completely original, and I researched my head off all over the place. Uh, to write this book, and I do have a bibliography. So there's plenty of good stuff out there about him. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on this af nice winter afternoon that doesn't really look like winter. And I hope you'll read more about William Allen White when you get a chance. Thank you very much. A special word of thanks. Thank you.